Alejandro Monteverde has co-written and directed the sleeper hit of the summer, Sound of Freedom. Eight years in the making, this low-budget indie film has grossed more than $167 million in less than six weeks, putting it on par with franchise offerings such as Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, as well as the latest installment of Mission Impossible. And yet much of the success of the film has been credited to the marketing tactics of distributor Angel Studios, as well as conspiracy-minded supporters repeating discredited QAnon theories. There have been accusations of racism and misleading storylines in the script itself. Monteverde, until now, has stayed relatively quiet, but he feels that others have hijacked the narrative of what he says is not a faith-based or an agenda-driven movie. I sat down with the director to discuss both his intent and the fallout from the movie. Here's the full conversation. Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Brady. I'm here with Alejandro Monteverde, who is the director of the sleeper hit of the summer, Sound of Freedom. For those of you who have not seen it, it's based on the true story of Tim Ballard, a former government agent who embarks on a mission to rescue children from, um, I guess you'd say it's child sex traffickers. That's the right way to do it. Alejandro, good to see you. Congratulations on doing so well at the box office thus far. $166 million as of early August, yes. basically. Yeah, I'm so excited. This is beyond any expectations. Um, let me ask you, I think the Genesis story of this movie is really interesting because it's at odds with what we're currently seeing in the press in terms of, you know, left wing, right wing, QAnon, you know. Talk about how this got onto your radar screen in the first place, the story. Yeah, to me, to me that is, the most important part and is a missing link that has been missing through the, throughout the entire coverage on this film. And that's why I decided to finally come out and, and, and start giving interviews. I had kept my distance because yeah. I, I just anything that becomes political, I, I keep my distance because I'm not a politician. So, and my, 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 my opinion has no impact, so why to even give any kinds of opinion? So the missing link that, that, that that's why I decided now to come out and start, uh -huh. you know, giving my my side of of the of the of the of, this, of how this how we got here. So in 2015, and I'm I'm not very good with years. But eight years ago, it was, <laughs> it was eight, eight years, years ago. Let's just say eight years ago. So eight years ago. I was, I'm, I'm, I'm a writer director, so I always write and then director, obviously, but I write more than direct, obviously. Yeah. And I was writing another project and I came to bed. And at that time it was before of iPads and all of these uh, nice toys that we have today. So I used to, it was when we had BTRs and you recorded yeah. the shows that you liked on TV and that's how you were able to watch them, right? And I always recorded three shows, Dateline NBC, 60 minutes and 2020. Mm -hmm. So what I can tell you news is junkie. one of those three. Yeah, news junkie. It was one of those three because, you know, they, they do stories and news reports that I really like because that's where I kind of gather my movies, right? So there was a piece, short piece, I remember. It was like 15 minutes on child sexual exploitation material. Mm -hmm. uh, and the distribution of it, and as a result, child trafficking. Now, I have never heard of that. I was not familiar with this subject. So it took me off guard and it really shook my soul that I couldn't sleep that night. I woke up the next day and I had a serious talk with my wife. I said to her, I need to make a movie about this. I need to create awareness on this because I didn't know. I wonder how many people don't know. Mm. And obviously I got a little resistant. At that time I only had one child and she's like, who wants to see a movie about that? And I'm like, I know it's gonna be tough, but I, I, I feel called to do this. And I always say there's two kinds of movies, the ones I wanna make and the ones that I'm called to make. And this is the ones that I feel like they're calling me to dive in and explore this thing. So I Can I interrupt one I sec? Started. How how many how many times do you get called to make a movie? Is are there been other instances like this? Because this is an every, eight year every, project. Uh, yeah, every film. This is 
uh, I this this was my third film. I just finished my fourth film. Yeah. Every film I've done has been a way kind of like a calling. Okay. I have my list of the movies I want to make that I haven't made yet. But yes, I'm all every movie I've done until now has been like a, a very strong calling that I feel I have to shine a light on this or I have to make a movie about this. So I go, I call my co-writer, Rod Barr, and I tell him, hey, let's do a movie on child trafficking. And obviously he's like, ah, a little resistant, but long story short, we started writing a fiction, complete fiction. It was called The Mongol. And mm -hmm. it was a, 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 a simple story about a guy that has a change of heart that was on the crime or organized crime that saw an opportunity to buy children and sell them to free them. And oh, so you were you were going to do know? a movie about the villain? Your central yeah. character was going to be the villain, not the not the rescuer. Well, no, no, no. He was he was he had a change of heart. Oh, so a he change was, of uh, heart. So crime. a former. So he was buying them to free them, to give them the freedom, right, like you know, like the se like the secondary character, right? Exactly, which is crazy because that was like that was like I couldn't believe it because I was already fictionalizing that story. And I was two months into it. I already had all the story beats in the movie and full on fiction, everything. You know, I remember I wanted, I was dreaming. I was like, oh, George Clooney will be the perfect because he was the mogul. He was a very wealthy man that, you know, was doing this. Well, long story short, I get a phone call from the producer of the film, Eduardo Verastegui, and he says, hey, do you know who Tim Ballard is? I'm like, no, he said, Google him and call me back. So I Googled him and I saw, wow, he would be amazing for me to get more information, right? So I still wasn't thinking to make a movie about his life. But when I meet Tim Ballard in person, which I think it was just a couple of days later, oh my, I was completely taken aback by the power of, her sto of his story. And yeah. I realized that his story surpassed the fiction that I was writing. And long story short, we were able to uh, get his life rights and I started working really close with Tim to f try to tell this story. And it was very challenging because in order to tell a story about this subject matter that an audience can digest, but also enjoy and go and create an, a, 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 an experience, a cinematic experience that is immersive, that the audience can go and really travel through this journey through darkness on a vehicle of hope. And when the movie ends, it really leaves you in a state of reflection and aware about this subject matter. That was the the, the purpose of all this journey. So, so we started and it was it was difficult because you know a lot of times when you make a biopic, the character is no longer alive. So you have a lot of freedom. You're like, oh, well, you know, everybody well, this is opened. based on a opened. true story. Right. So so that's part of what's interesting here. I mean, the part that I actually found the least believable was that his wife would accept him quitting his job mere months before he'd have a vested pension with that many kids. I was yeah. like, hold on a second. But but yeah. tell me about the parts that had to be amplified for that reason. You're taught like that, that sort of heart of darkness like journey where he's going into essentially rebel territory to rescue. No spoiler alerts. We don't know. If, um, but yeah. was that was that a part of the true story? Because I'm not quite well, sure what well, the real story yeah, of so Tim Ballard is. Yeah. So, you know, just like any biopic that we see, every biopic, I watch a lot of biopics. I think I've watched every biopic that is out there, I dare to say. And, you know, every biopic, the minute you have, you know, an actor playing Mozart, that's already, that's not Mozart, obviously. And no yeah. one was there when Mozart was alive, that is today. So you create, you take, a, you have to, to cre if you don't cr take creative licenses, you will not have an entertaining movie. You will have a documentary or, you know, you, what you recreate of events. That was never my goal. I was to tell a story that creates awareness on child trafficking. The, yeah, that's fair. The, the vehicle, the vehicle was the story of Tim Ballard. So what I did as a filmmaker with my co-writer, we spent a lot of time with Tim, downloading information from him and always asking him permission. Hey, can we view this? And he's like, well, a few times, I will dare to say that 75% of the film is as accurate as it happened in real life. There is a good 20% that I had to take creative license to just be able to take all these years of his life into an hour and a half or two hours that the movie That's is. That's fair. So you have to do that. But 
The one thing that it is true, by the way, is yeah, he did left his pension and left everything to do this. It's uh, it, that was the most heroic for me thing that he did more than going into the dark of heart of the the heart of darkness. And in a lot of things, the style of the film, I actually wanted the audience to know that they were watching a movie. I wanted, I didn't want to be re too realistic in terms because otherwise you wouldn't be able to digest this. It's already hard enough just to see. Uh, an old man with a child in the same room. So I wanted the audience to be like, hey, you watching, you're on Broadway. You're watching a show. You're watching an spectacle. You're watching a movie. That's what the lighting is so stylized. And you know, the fight, there's a fight. I didn't want it to be real, like a real fight. I want it to be symbolical that we have, we're in a fight between light and darkness. And I wanted that fight to feel more symbolical than real. And so, was, so Tim was, Tim Ballard oh. never went head to head with uh, that. That part's the creative license. I mean, I don't want to unpack the uh, movie that, because those who haven't seen say it that, should see it. We we could say that he 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 did go. He's been his life has been on uh, many times yep. even worse than that, to the point that he thought he was going to die. Uh, yep. So that's why I would say well, I would only take creative license if it happened. So he had an incident that was very close to that where he didn't even have a chance to die, to fight, where he was just going to be, you know, killed and in the middle of nowhere. So I was like, well, you went through that in another country. Can I take that and put it here? And it took months for him, for me to convince him because he hmm. wanted to stay really true. But yes, those are the little things I will put in the 20 percent that I oh. took some creative licenses uh, in order. But the essence is that's what I stay, decided to stay true. The essence, you know, of his desire is. to go and risk his life to rescue children. That is, he risks his life until to still today. He wouldn't have no problem. Even if they tell him, you go there, you die, he still will go. Well, uh, you know, I, I wanna, there's so much to unpack here, including the fact you've got a really interesting, you know, business model, but I wanna stick with the plot for now because you're, the reaction, you know, this, this, it, it has become a sleeper hit in part because it really has become a, you know, a call to action for a lot of groups. And talk about the, when you started to become aware, well, let me go back a bit. The next stage, you're working on this movie, um, the distribution challenge, um, Angel Studios, which is a, a Utah based, you know, does a lot of faith based content. They were your distributor. Was that something that you think was a factor in how people have reacted to the movie? Or I'm, I'm curious to get your take since you've been on the front lines of this whole thing. Yeah, well, you know, the, we, we went through a very tough times finding a distributor. Uh, first, because of COVID. Second, it's a very difficult movie to market. So I wanna say that I don't know which distributor saw the film, but I don't blame him for not for not taking it. It's not an easy movie to market. Just as whether it's it, uh, it's just a hard film. I mean, market. Schindler's it's, List isn't easy to market either. From a exactly, upbeat. exactly. So what? And, why I would and, and, I would imagine why would it be hard to market a movie like this? We were coming out of COVID, and their their thinking was that people wanted to see happy films with, with like you know very kind of like not deep because they wanted to kind of find an out. And it was because we were coming out of COVID and it was two years of people, you know, it was like, we need something hopeful. And for me, Sound of Freedom is hopeful, but in a more profound way, because the darkness and, you know, the, the, the atrocities are out there and they come in all yeah. shapes of form. And if we're aware of it, a society that is aware and has created a dialogue about any challenge, guess what? Change is gonna happen. So that was that was the goal, but I understand why the challenge. And so when Angel Studios came, I met with them for the first time. And yes, in the beginning, I was like- That was in oh, March of know. this year, right? Yes, yes, around there. And when I met with them, I was blown away. I came in very skeptic. I was like, oh, my movie's gonna get labeled and this and that for whatever- well, What were you worried you about? Alejandro, what, what well, I, I, were you skeptical I have, about? I have, I, have, I have been a victim of everything I do that people tend to label because I'm attracted to themes 
that are controversial. I just like those things. They call me. Mm -hmm. And I, I, every movie I've done, they label me. They label the film. And it's, I always give this example, the hamburger example. Imagine you have a, a, a hamburger, the best hamburger in the world. The bread was done by a Muslim. The meat was done by a Buddhist. And the, 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 the waiter is a Catholic. And you have the burger, and then you say, oh, this is a religious burger. No, it's not. It's a burger. And we should just call it a burger. Don't label it a religious burger. But that's what's happened with my art. Everything they, la they label it, like, oh, this is this. Oh, this is this. It's all labeled. So I th automatically thought, I was like, well, they're going to label this film. You know, but at the, but then I was like, no, why would they label it as a faith based? Label it movie? as a faith based? based? Is that is that yes, you were worried about that? Yes, yes, yes. And I was like, but then I was thinking, no, they're not going to label it as a faith based because it's not faith based. You know, Silence by Martin Scorsese, they didn't label it as a faith based. And you have priests all around, and it's really a dilemma whether a priest is going to die for his faith or not. And they didn't label. It. I'm like, no, they're not going to label it. But then I met the three Harmon brothers. And I have to say, I met three marketing geniuses and three very incredible minds. And I was blown away by them. I was like, I want to work with them. And that's where this journey began. They're, they're, they're three young brothers that think outside the box, that believed in the film, and they were very excited about it. And they had big expectations. And they put this whole marketing plan and they allow me to at least, you know, ride the wave with them. Uh, obviously, I, I became a, a little pain for them because, you know, we, we have to agree to disagree and, and many things, which is that's the best. What did you disagree? You know? What did you disagree on? I mean, it's interesting because when uh, I've seen the trailer just, for the movie, I'd say that I'd say that they did take a faith based marketing approach, which is yeah. fair enough. Right. That's the nature of, yeah. of what they do. So. So your yeah. fears were realized in some ways, but yet didn't turn out yes, so bad, but at did the it? End, but at, exactly. At the end, you know, this is this is one thing that I, when they speak your language, it's the most beautiful language. I, when I direct a movie, I let tell people, let me do my work. I'll yep. hear your opinions, but if we have too many ideas and too many captains, we're gonna create a Frankenstein. So what I beg all my investors and the people that work with me is please trust me. Because when I make a movie, nobody understands what I'm doing. They get scared. I'm like, trust me. So here, at one point, they came to me and they say, Alejandro, trust us. We know what we're doing. Trust us. And yes, I started seeing, and then I started, you know, this is a funny story. Throughout my years, you, know, you make a lot of friends, and sometimes you don't tell them what you do, right? Because that's why yeah. you know you you go. You, I haven't even taken trips, so we don't even they don't even know I'm a filmmaker. I got two or three different friends to recommend me "Sound of Freedom" by text. They didn't know I made it, and oh. I know them, their background. They are not the audience that the media has said they are. Oh, this is a conservative. They are do not fit in that category. And then I started seeing a lot of my friends because I am friends with everybody. I'm not friends with one group or another group. Because yeah, yeah. I'm an immigrant, I'm from Mexico. I came here. And I'm an immigrant friends. from Canada. All yeah. hail immigrants. So for, and I, I have a lot of Canadian friends. So for me, I, 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 I don't ever participate on any kind of division. I'm friends literally, I always dare to say to anybody, I bet you you don't have a friends that believe this, this, and that. I say yes, I do, and or that dresses like well, this. You said you had fears that this would be labeled faith based. Why would that be something that would bother you prior to now, even the encountering them? Yeah, the, the word fear is a big, big word. So it definitely was not fear. Concern it was a, a concern because they've done it to all my other movies, and on this one, because of. The, the past films that Angel Studio had distributed had to do with 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 you know faith based uh, 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 narratives. I automatically say, well, the way unfortunately we live in today, we live with this tendency that we must label everything, everybody. It's like we mm -hmm. must. It's almost like a, an urge, which I'm like, why? It's like 
it's better if you don't label anything. But we live in that society, so we're like, okay, they, we, we may be able to, to fall in that category. But then uh, again, I'm thinking, no, they can't label it because the movie is not. You cannot label, you can, it's like if you have make, you know, a beautiful bottle of mezcal and your, your concern is that they're gonna label it as vodka. You're like, it's impossible. It's a completely different alcohol. It's gonna, it's gonna be mezcal. Well, in here, I was like, it's impossible. And to my surprise, they label it, but something beautiful happened. And you, there's no price to this. The audience started watching the movie and they are the ones that started defending it and saying it's not faith-based. It's a movie for everybody. Then we started seeing the polls and we started seeing that this, uh, the audience was completely bipartisan. You cannot get to $200 million with one, only one side of the spectrum. There's no movie that has arrived to that with only one side. If you if you crossing those numbers, guess what? Your movie is bipartisan well, and it has crossover. It's it's um it's in so in a way is this how important was the marketing strategy to getting people initially in the seats of the theater? Do you think because this was just released in July? I think the opening weekend, if I'm not mistaken, um, triumphed you know over Indiana Jones. So it seems like that. That's the time when people haven't yet seen the movie. So marketing was very important. Do you think the faith-based marketing was a critical driver at the beginning? Well, marketing is important to every single film. I mean, if, if, if I don't know if you know budgets, but if I'm not going to say numbers. No, I, but no definitely were, nobody you, should quiz you, me on you, budgets for movies. If, yeah, if, but if you, if you, you will be, if you will not believe it, if you were to find out the budgets on the big studio movies, how much they spend on marketing, you will not believe it. It's sometimes it's twice what the movie cost, like or more. Well, your like, movie we're, only we're cost hand- fourteen and a half million dollars. Like that's yeah. incredible. You made a movie for yeah. so little. Yeah. So there's um, there's marketing budgets that are in the hundreds of millions. So here on this particular film, we can we didn't have hundreds of millions. So we own well, I don't want to take credit. Angel Studios understood that the best billboard for this film was gonna be word of mouth. How do you create a word of mouth? Is you have to have start by people watching the film. And they went out and they started this campaign that it was about to create word of mouth and create awareness on the film. And I do think, of course, it will be the faith-based audience where definitely wanted to go see it, but it's not like the faith-based audience is weird. It's like, we think this, they're isolated, no. No, I, like I, you I could have one person. You could have one person that is, you know, practice his faith, but his mother, his father, his brother, his uncle, his neighbor, they practice what they go see the film and they go it's like, you have to see this movie. It's not a faith based film. I know you're not a Christian. I know you might be all the religion, but go see the film. It has nothing to do. This movie was not for one person. It was for the human beings. If you're a human being, well, you're going to like this movie. That was well, the you know, narrative it's... that the word of mouth kicked in. It's interesting, and I want to get into so much. You know, obviously, you've you've had so many different innovative strategies here, but the term faith-based. I just want to pause a second because I don't think of faith as as a, a dirty word. I'm from a multi-faith family. Is it become tainted in some way? Like we're talking about faith-based as if that's a bad thing. Why is it a bad thing? Is it because it's disconnected to the actual plot, or because it no. evokes something that is what you don't want? to associate no, with. No, unfortunately, unfortunately, unfortunately is, you know, if you go back into the 40s and 50s, that that level of faith-based was actually a good label. I mean, Oscar-winning movies. Yeah. Know, Charles the Headstone. I mean, you were, it was different because it was associated with good art. Unfortunately, today, some films you cannot generalize some base face film the quality of the filmmaking it's you know so it's almost one of the propaganda because yeah or the quality you know it's not like it doesn't have in and 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 the hope is to change that it's a hey let's this maybe let's give a good name if if we are if we already gonna get it seems like it's very hard to fight the the label well, 
Let's make it in a gray label, you know, not a label where it looks like you're making a, not an entertainment. At the end, I do feel people go to the movies to watch good cinema and to be entertained. They don't yep. care. if Even if it has a label, but the movie's good, it's okay. The problem um, is, you know. Well, l- let me ask a bit about the, the star. So Jim Caviezel, I remember seeing, it was a Passion of the Christ, you know, great actor. When you were um, at re- recruiting him for the role, um, he's a strong personality who's been out there. Was that something that uh, you thought, well, does that increase the odds of people having certain perceptions of the film? Because I know he's been yeah. actively so promoting me, I, it in I, a different way. And for me, this is going to sound a little pretentious, but I say with humbleness, I am very loyal and a, a very uh, committed to my work, to my art. And I, as a director, I really don't care. I, that's why I work with everybody. I really don't care what they believe in their private lives. I really don't. I just want to work with the best character and the best actor for my film. I've become very selfish in that department. As you so should be. When I, when I met Jim, I saw his conviction for, he understood this subject matter more than me because he, he, this is very close to his heart very close he's he's yep. father of three and i cannot talk more about it but it is public he adopted three kids from china mm. so he understands this like nobody else and i knew right there when i met him that he was actually willing to die for this film so when we went to shoot it was not an easy shoot we were shooting six days a week and the most difficult situations that we could have because of our budget and I saw an actor that was so committed that Will's coming in and giving his all, literally his all, that for me, that's what I take. I'm like, that's, that is one of the most professional actors that I've ever worked. He gave his all and how he connected with the character because I needed to do it all through the eyes and really convey this pain that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a worldwide pain. I always say children, should not have a nationality. We don't, whales don't have nationality. When we say let's sell the whales, we don't say let's sell the Mexican whales. We should say we have to protect the children of the world. And that in itself, it's where we're gonna become a world problem. It's not, it's not an American problem. It's a world problem. When, when Donald, that that was, that's how I work with. No, I think that's fair. Well, you know, you've had a number of people come out publicly and very um, vociferously for the movie, like, like Donald Trump. When you got an endorsement from him, was that, uh, how did you feel about that? He loved the movie. Well, for, yeah, for me, I have to say one thing, and that's why I, I, this is, I think, one of my few first interviews. Well, thank uh, you for that. I, 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 thank you. I ran away from anything that is political because I am not in politics. Yeah. So, from anything, it doesn't matter what side or anything. If it has to do with politics, I distance myself because politics divide, and I like to make movies that unite and create social dialogue. I like to make movies that proposes a question, never to impose. I'm looking for answers, so never to impose a a a a, a, a theme. So when you start having screenings with political figures, I myself decided to not be part of them because I don't want to, you know, unfortunately we are in a world that that automatically is gonna create a division. I am a storyteller, I'm an author. I like to make movies, not for one group or another group. I like to make movies for everybody. Everybody is my audience. I like to make movies for human beings so when 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 there's screenings like this, uh, I'm aware of them. I know that they also did a screening, which is is uh, 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 for all of the Congress bipartisan. Yeah. Uh, I'm aware also that the current president, you know, got the film. I'm aware. I don't know if he saw it. I'm aware that the former president saw the film. I'm aware of that, but I, I'm just I just create awareness. That's fair. Oh, I'm well- aware. But I don't have an opinion on That's on, fair. I, I don't see on, there's probably not an upside in taking sides, you know, but um, the crowdfunding, I have to, of course, mention, you know, you had what, 6,000 plus crowdfunders, one of whom I have to be, was it Fabian Marta was in the news recently as 
an accessory to a child kidnapping. I think the headlines were somewhat wrong. It's not quite as, but that, you know, that must be one of the fears of anybody who has a crowdfunded uh, movie these days because it's such a large cohort. Yeah. You don't know who's in there. It yeah. makes news because you know the headline sells. What did what did you think when that came out? Well, that that's the same as anything. You know, it's like you know, I, it's like when you buy a pair of shoes or or you invest on the stock market. You can't control what the people are gonna do. You know, so you that's you know when I you know when I'm in a movie normally around two thousand people work in a movie. I don't know if one of those people are going to do something crazy. I can't control that. It's, it's what's that's why it's called crowdfunding, and yeah. that was part of the that was part of the distribution department. Uh, it had nothing to do with the funding of the film. Uh, right. You know, if you have money on the stock market, and one the, the one of the guys, like maybe the guy that from the head of the board of directors goes and does the most atrocious thing that a human being can think of, he cannot be responsible for that. So in this case, you know, I was aware of the situation, but I also at the same time, it was for me, it was so obvious. It's like, yeah, you can control 7,000 people. Well, the I, chances I didn't realize are, 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 it was, forgive my ignorance, I actually thought it was, it, the way it was, I thought it was part of the funding for production. So this was only crowdfunding for the distribution. So it was really oh, 100%. Angel, so it was Angel yeah, Studios so the, the that movie, was going out yeah. part of their strategy. Angel, okay. Studios, Angel Studios bought the film we, the, the, we we made the movie in 2018. We yeah, had yeah. finished. We were on the, we were on an, another distributor. I think we were Fox International. Yeah. We did it with Fox, and then Disney bought Fox, and then we kind of became orphan. So that and then the movie was fully funded. And if you see the film at the end, there's all the all the people that funded this film. They're very powerful uh, public figures. So I cannot say their names myself, but they're public. You can go see the movie. There, you can just sit if you sit names. through to the end. Well, yeah. the pay. So what about the those, pay? Those, those... Go ahead, Alejandro. Yeah. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, interrupt you. Go ahead. No, no. What I'm saying is those 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 guys. You know, they're very public also about where they stand on all the political spectrum. So you will realize that this was a very bipartisan joint venture to shine a light on 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 human trafficking. The Talk about the pay it forward, because that's something that I know is getting a lot of attention in Hollywood, which is basically people who love the movie, especially those who have maybe more of an perhaps an activist, you know, mentality around this, like people have to see this, are buying tickets for other moviegoers to see the film. Yeah. Um, is that talk a bit about that? Yeah. How important is that the a way, factor the in way, success? Yeah. The way I see that is. When I met with the Harmon brothers, they explained to me very simple. They say, Alejandro, the way this movie can actually make a hundred million dollars is if we create a very strong word of mouth. How do you create a strong word of mouth? Is if people see the movie. People need to see the movie so they can recommend it. You cannot recommend something you haven't seen. How do we get people to see the movie? Well, there has to be like a push and that's just the pay it forward. A lot of people in America today because of money, uh, but, you know, you can see not a lot of people going to the movies, not because they don't like the movies, because the movies have become a little too expensive. And more if you have a family of four or five, five people is $60, $70. So they created this whole idea of paying it forward to create awareness. So, but there's, that's just a small amount of the tickets and they will do it. And then it's like the best way to recommend the movie, like a uh, walking billboard, is if somebody calls me and says, hey, instead of buying the movie, I got you, you, you got free tickets. So then you go see the film, then you uh -huh. recommend the movie more. And what happens when more movies see the film? They are aware. There's been so many cases that this this makes me emotional, where people, now that they're aware of human trafficking, they're at a coffee shop and they're looking and they see something strange because they're aware now about this. They make a phone call. There were two or three cases that are ready and they, was, they were right. They were trafficking and selling that, that minor for sex. And it was this person that saw the movie Sound of Freedom because now they're aware. So that awareness has no price. Whoa. The social awareness that we have, that we're creating, is very important. I was not aware about child trafficking eight years ago. I knew about human trafficking, but not child trafficking for sexual exploitation because in my head it's like, why? Why would you want, like, it's, it's just Isn't so Isn't it a very dark. small, uh, uh, it's interesting because one of the, I, I'm thinking of a case actually on Southwest recently where it was, 
a, a white mother with her black child and and basically the flight attendant called in 911 because she believed that that person the mother was trafficking a young girl which is interesting because it speaks to a certain paranoia your movies about hope do you worry at all that too much awareness can also create demons where there are none like child sex trafficking in the way you portray it is a very small proportion of the kids in sex work in this country at least well yes but the biggest and, one is in the family families right? are the uncle is is molesting their their and a lot of the times the children goes to their parents and the parents don't believe them don't believe because them, they're like yeah. how why would why would you my uncle your uncle want to touch you in your private parts he's why? That makes no sense. Well, now guess what? If a child comes and tells the mom, this is what happened to me in school, the mom is gonna be like, oh, this is happening. There is, okay, yesterday, NBC, yesterday. NBC, yesterday. I have the news right here. A yeah. hundred pedophiles arrested. It's like, wow, a hundred, not one, not two. Uh, and out of those 178 were in the United States. 78. And they were, and 12 children were rescued. 12 and they were all creating child uh, explosion. was that because of the move was it material. linked to the movie no Did no, they link no. it back to the movie so. but it could be um I mean, but, in general maybe it could be but 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 one thing is this now is news this is not new before it was not news because for whatever reason when i was writing the movie in 2016 i was researching and something would pop it would only last in the news very little it's because there was not awareness now it's lasting longer. People are talking about it. People are, but a lot of victims are coming forward that they were quiet. That's another thing. A lot of people now are coming forward and say, I'm, I was a victim, I was a victim, I was a victim. And yes, it opens up now that the majority of sexual exploitation with children are in the family. Mothers allowing it sometime or looking the other way. And now those kids are gonna have a voice. And that's what I wanted to do in this film. I wanted to make a movie about child exploitation on the on sex on the sexual fair. industry and what? and that and, and 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 unfortunately things got a little south but at the end the audience are continuing to see the film and what i'm more excited is about this these labels will be broken if i don't know we don't know what's going to happen we're, we're coming out internationally i leave tomorrow for colombia but we're coming out on all around the world over there, there is not these conspiracy theories. Over there, they're completely disconnected from what from from what's happening. What I call the biggest island in the world, like the United States. We think we're the only ones, but outside, because I do tend to travel a lot, there's a completely different way of life, and they're not trapped in all of these divisions into oh, you belong there, you belong there. No, no, they're, they're they have their own divisions, but they're not they're not part of the American divisions. If we come back with also a strong voice and a strong box office internationally then all the labels that we have been put in here we're gonna break them because over there yet there is no the labels that we have here they don't have we don't have those labels there is no two parties there is the no when you talk about the labels political. you're talking about coming out and I, I appreciate the time you're giving me i know a lot of people are asking for your time but is it let's talk about q anon since that's one of the labels do you well, disavow? That label, that, that label, like, what does that yeah, well, mean? That label, I, I, that, because I don't know anything about them. I didn't even took the time because I didn't care to. to I, guess, really, I guess there's you know, racist, my time, my, you know, white time, supremacy. Well, I didn't yeah, see any of that, time, by the way. Yeah, exactly. So those labels, I really, because exactly, they're so ridiculous that I didn't give attention to them. I'm going to tell you the one I did give attention. So all those names, which I don't even know, and I didn't even know anything about it. So I, I literally, genuinely don't know what those conspiracy theories are because I don't I, I, my time is precious I have three kids so I don't have, if I'm going to spend time it has to be on something that is soft I don't yeah, have yeah, Instagram yeah. Facebook I don't have social media so but one of them that I saw is which is not true it's this is what I was like this is not true we have the numbers is this is a film only for the conservative audience that is not true we have the numbers we have the polls and you what know, do the numbers say? What do the numbers say? There, there was an article, I think they were putting us around 40% of the audience, the moviegoers, were Democrats. It's, it's not mine, there was an article out there. 
And well, and, very you know, big with old, Hispanic uh, audiences too, right? Uh, yeah. It's been very, very popular big, with Hispanic. Very, very, yeah, and very big. I'm a Hispanic. I'm a Mexican, and it's also very big that they also want to label the Hispanic market to say that they are all belong to one party. They're like, oh, all, all Hispanics are Democrats. That's not true. I know. That's racist in itself. Enough. So, exactly. Those labels, to me, every label falls in that dangerous category. I, I, I'm against labeling at all times because you have to get to know somebody, a human being, for at least more than five years to be able to dare to say that you know them. It takes, my mother one day said, it takes a lifetime to get to know one person, lifetime. So how can you say and reduce a person or, a, uh, or the product of their work into one word? If you don't know, like in this case, they don't know that I, I uh, this story, the, the way I came up with the calling to do this was eight years ago watching in the media itself. So that, that missing link was not there. So it's just, to me, it's part of, of, of the miscommunication that we we tend to kind of end up in these situations. I, I want to just ask a few other quick questions. One, in retrospect, when you look at the plot, do you think there are any elements of this plot that might have signaled the, you know, that, let's say, triggered? And, and one being, of course, we've got this, you know, with Jim Caviezel and the character of Tim Ballard, a white, good-looking, relatively young American guy going to rescue these kids in another country where there's a infrastructure of people that could rescue them themselves. Is that one of the things that you think um, perhaps creates the wrong impression? You know, when people make this accusation of like no, almost white no, man's burden. No, because if they, they, the the people that would take the time to dig in, because you know a lot of the times, I mean, there is in like everything, there's good doctors and bad doctors. There is great journalists like yourself that do the homework. Thank you. And then there are some journalists that quote it that I directed movies that I've never seen. So mm. what? It's like, oh yeah, they say you directed this. I was like, well, that's pretty sloppy. They should really, it's one minute to find my film, my filmography. So in this case, anybody that takes their time and say, well, who's the author? At the end, the author is the one. If, oh, he's Mexican, born in Mexico. Yep. Uh, a U.S. Not, not naturalized uh, citizen. And he's the one that wrote, directed and produced the film. Okay, well, I don't think he's into any of the white supremacy or these things. I think he just casted somebody that looked like Tim Ballard. Okay, yeah, and that's fair. This guy. So that is that is really the the threat. Now, to me, that's a conspiracy. We, we blame conspiracy, but the other side, it's also a conspiracy because it's not true. So it's like, well, maybe it's the white savior ideology. Well, it's not. It's not true. It's like the same thing with the vodka and the tequila. It's not vodka, it's mezcal, it's tequila. So I'm calling it vodka. Yep. Same thing in here. It's like, they can cons they can create a theory around it, but it's not true. But you point to a real issue, which is interesting around the media, because even this often happens, but on Rotten Tomatoes, I last I checked, it was 99% approval ratings from audiences. Um, still positive, but less so from mainstream critics. And, you know, there's this perception among some that mainstream critics tend to skew left. Is that, do you feel like there's a disconnect between what the general public, how they're reacting to this movie and the coverage that you're getting? Because that's partly why you're doing this interview. Oh my gosh, I, I, I was waiting for this question my whole life. Thank you for oh, asking. Oh, good. <laughs> We've hours, I off you go. Believe, <laughs> especially with my movies, there's a massive disconnect. I did one movie that I broke the record on the disconnect. The, on the, I don't know if it's really? still on, but I made I made a movie called Little Boy, and I had at one point I had like ninety something percent, and I had eight percent from the critics. So that disconnect, I was like, so I I am I am a living witness of what that disconnect is. On this one, you know, we for many many weeks we had a hundred percent from over ten thousand audiences, and they're all verified because they're yeah, verified yeah. from meter. meter a hundred for weeks, we just came down to 99. So yes, there's a massive, massive disconnect. I stopped reading Rotten Tomatoes because of that. So yeah, I, I, I do think there is a, 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 a disconnect with, with, with that, at least with my films. It may not be, I can only speak for me. This is not a, I always say there is two things, facts and opinions. This mm -hmm. is not a fact opinion. Uh, so for my movies, 
I feel that there's a disconnect. So I'm, I will not generalize for other movies. It's because that may be closer. Why, why is that? What does that tell you about whether it's mainstream media, of which I'm, of course, a part? I don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm attracted to, to, to movies that propose questions that are difficult questions. So I always like to make films that are in regards with that. And I feel like many times they fall victim on a label. And by the time the critics come to see the film, it already has a label. So they, 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 they have a little bit of, a, of, of, of a prejudice of how they're going to, um, you know, judge the film. Now, not everybody, you know, in Little Boy I had 8%, so there was a few critics that loved the film. Uh, you know, and, you know, in, 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 in Sound of Freedom, you know, we got like 60, say 67 or 69%. And yeah. know, so that means there's a few critics that do like what I'm doing. and But yes, I, I don't have. Um, but it, it, it that disconnect, because part of what you've tapped into, whether it's you or, or Angel Studios, there's a certain level of anger, a lack of trust in institutions. Um, you know, this is you have your main character is a Department of Homeland Security official who quits his job before his getting his pension and goes rogue, basically. Um, that that sort of speaks to a certain, um, you know, a certain group of Americans that really don't trust the media, don't trust Washington, et cetera, et cetera, which, frankly, is one of the reasons you're here today talking to me. Yeah. I mean, it's very interesting because, you know, I moved to this country when I was around 18 years old. And, you know, I, 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 this country has been, to me, so giving. You know, I yeah. built my dream here. I met my wife here. I, I went to college here. I made my first movie here. You know, I, I do, you know, the, the whole support of freedom, you know, we you do have freedom of speech. You know, yep. I come from a country that if you speak a little too much, you may disappear. So it's uh, it's 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 I, I the opportunities that I have had in this country, I, I I I am completely grateful. But I also started noticing that as as the longer I'm here, the longer I started seeing this division. You know, I, I came here. Yeah, I don't know, 20 or something years ago, more than 20 years ago. And I just feel like the country's continuing to kind of politically divide even further and further. And even though I always say the power of one, I said my job is I love to bring them together in what they agree. I don't want them to agree on what they disagree. They can continue to disagree on that. But to open up to the things that they do agree, it's just like we can start with wine. I bet you, if like, if you, hey, what kind of wine you like? If you both like uh, Bujule, well, let's drink Bujule. And, or if you're both parents, okay, well, then you know, or even more. If you both know and have experienced a level of suffering. So imagine you take one character that represents the far ideology of one particular party, and then another yep. character that represents the opposite. But they both lost their child. And well, yeah, that's finding common ground. Well, I bet you that connect, they can be more connected than people that agree with them because they have not experienced that level of, which is the human pain and that suffering can bring societies together if we focus on what we agree. And we will yeah. find out that we agree in more things that we disagree. But if we, if, if we are always continues to be pushed in what we disagree, we're never gonna get to enjoy the things that we do agree. So that's me as a storyteller. I like to make films that bring people together. And I always, that's my big my big uh, calling for me as a well, filmmaker. I love to, to just bring to bring audiences together. So, so you're going international. Um, who's distributing, when is that happening? And uh, any news on, on how that's happening? How many countries yeah. and I, mean, uh, I live tomorrow to Colombia and I'm doing a tour all the way Colombia, Argentina, Brazil, all the way down to Mexico. Then I go to London and then I know uh, Australia and then many places in in in, in, uh, in 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 Europe. So I think what they're doing is they're they're doing a rollout but really quick. I mean 
these are premieres. So once the premiere is, the movie comes out the next day. So it's coming out within a week and a half in the next 10 days in at least 25 countries or more. And will it be a very different marketing strategy, do you anticipate, to your point? Yes, I think every marketing, every country is going to have the, the, the distributor's way of marketing. But I, I, this is me talking. This I don't know if this is, if I'm just logic, common sense. If I'm a distributor in France and I'll be like, wow, this movie made close to $200 million in the U.S., I will for sure be calling the distributors. I will, okay, what do you Saying, guys do? How is that? Yeah, the techniques. So, um, there, there will be some influences, but it's different cultures. There's different, you know, that the whole thing of faith base doesn't exist there. So that you can that label at least we won't have. How is uh, how is Tim Ballard reacting? I know that one of the challenges with a movie is um, you get more scrutiny. You mentioned that he's not dead; he's very much alive, and there's been more scrutiny of. You know, did he really do this? Did he really do that in the movies? And that's one of the unpleasant consequences, I think, of having a movie based on a true story about you. Um, how have you found the coverage of him? Well, in the beginning, I, ju I was just doing research, and then I spent two years just downloading but as much information. Post-movie, do you think the coverage, because he's come under scrutiny for what did he do or not oh. do, and part of what, of course, is, you know, um, your movie's well, based on me, a true I think, story. I think, so. I think for him, for he might be harder because he's, you know, he, he, he's, he's an agent and he's still doing that work. For me, it's a lot easier because I embrace it. I say, yes, it's a movie. <laughs> and, you know, my favorite films of all time is Amadeus. And I doubt that Salieri say, I kill Mozart. And I, I, another movie that I love is Hawksaw Ridge. And, you know, it's like, how do you know how he hiding on like all these elements that no one was there? How do you know how those things happen if you were not there and the guy is no longer here? You're an entertainer. So it's normal for a for an artist and a filmmaker to take creative licenses. You have to. So for me, it's I embrace it. I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, for me, it's normal. It's like, hey, are you wearing black? Well, yeah, yeah you, you, your Tell your me. element was fictionalized. His maybe. Yeah. He's got to go back and, and explain what was or wasn't. Anything you've exactly. learned. So, in, in, so in I, I, I actually tell Tim Ballard, I say, hey, when they tell you that, tell him it was me because he was me. It was not him telling me I was the one trying to push the story farther. I'm like, hey, can I do this? Hey, can I? So in a way, he's more if, if, if I, I had to kind of stretch a little bit things to, to make things more exciting. Yeah. Um, so you know, uh, say, hey, you know, filmmaker wanted There's to stretch your, it. Blame the he, filmmaker, he, exactly. But to uh, his point, there were some many things that he did not let me do. I was like, hey, can I do that? He says, no, that's too far. No, you can't do that. I, I, that I'd love to happen. sit in a room and hear some of those yeah. pitches, but. The ones that he did allow is because he was like, that essence, that has happened. I have willingly. Okay about to die and I, I i did it for the children so those are the things that he kind of allowed me but also i don't want to discredit that there is a big chunk i will say 70 to 75 percent of the film it's as close as accurate as it can be so alejandro let's go back full circle to end on on the genesis of what got you here what have you learned from the past several weeks you've had as I said, this has become a, a cause celeb, certainly among um, a certain group of people, QAnon supporters of whom, you know, Jim Caviezel, I would put in that camp. I think he would put himself in the camp of being at the very least sympathetic. Um, what do what I, I get your message, but what have you learned and what would you say to that group of people who who have been very important in driving the success of this film? Well, I, I wish I was more familiar uh, maybe you can educate me. I don't, I'm not familiar with any groups uh, outside of the regular overall audience. Yeah. Um, I know that when they say faith based audience, I always get confused. Well, it's, it's, it's like what? It's like you pick up the mic and they all listen. It's like, how do you type? Because, you know, faith based audience, do, do you put Muslims, Jewish? Uh, Catholics, Christians, and like, what what faiths are we talking about when you yeah, say faith? Yeah, it's a stereotype. Faith? 
And then they may say, well, because, you know, I, I'm Catholic, so I don't know what, you know, I, 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 it's, it's sad, but because, you know, I, I, I do try to go every Sunday and I've never heard somebody talking about my movie in the Catholic. I'm like, well, I don't know if the Catholics are, are why they're not pushing this movie, but I don't know, or, or at least not in church. So when they say the faith-based marketing, I have no idea how that works. So I don't know how that moves. All I know is this. I was asking friends of mine that are not in the faith base. Actually, if, if we if we wanted to put it in, in that category, they're not only not on the face, but they're actually in the opposite world. You know, they're mm -hmm. more of like as, as full on mainstream as you can be. And they're like, hey, man, I'm getting bombarded with Sound of Freedom stuff. I was like, how? He's like, I don't know, in my YouTube, in my Instagram, in my thing. And this, this, this is, this is friends that I can tell you they're in the other part of the spectrum of anything that has been brought up. That's why I'm like, that's not true when they say, oh, they have the conservative audience. I'm like, that's not true because my little group of friends, they're getting bombarded with the movie on Facebook. Yeah. So the Angel Studios, the Harmon Brothers, they were able to do a very strong social media outreach. I have no idea how they were able to kind of tap into everybody. My wife also was getting, they don't know, you know, she's my wife, but they were like, I was like, so at one point it started to become everywhere. And so it's viral. that in itself, yeah, it went viral. And I do think now it had to do, I think, because one of the things that I did see, because I don't have me, social media, but people share with me. And unfortunately, when they share, send me Instagram or Facebook, they don't let you see it if you don't have. So I cannot see anything they send me from Instagram. They send me, hey, look at this Instagram. And I click and it's like, you don't have an account. You can't you see it. You have to join, yeah. But TikTok, TikTok, when they send them to me, I do. And I did see a good over a dozen videos on TikTok that people were just texting me of just regular kids coming out and sitting in their car and saying, you have to go see this film. And then I was like, okay. So then I would call a friend of mine and say, hey, do you have TikTok? Yeah, can you tell me how many followers? Oh man, 700,000 followers, like, wow. Can you tell me what's the background? I'm very, very liberal. Like, no, they're actually boom, boom, boom. And I'm like, oh, wow. So so you feel so, you're, it's, yeah, being painted it, unfairly it, in one side. You be painted one sided, they didn't cover the other side, like, hey, this movie it's transcended the label because it was never meant to be for one people. It, what it did, you cannot reach these numbers if you didn't transcend a label. And I'm so grateful that it did transcend the label. That's that's the the massive uh, uh, thing. No, well, and for me, 166 I'm million. Able to share my side. Yeah, 166 million thus far. I'm sure you'll hit that 200 million box office point as you're about to go uh, international as well. Alejandro, thank you so much for your time and joining thank us, you and so good much. luck.